<laughs> Muggsy Bogues, I want to welcome you to the show. We have an NBA legend and off here joining me here on the show here tonight for Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max, who goes by the name of Muggsy Bogues. <clears throat> Brand new book out right now. Make sure you go check it out. We're going to dive right into it. Muggsy, how's it going? How's, how's it going? Welcome to the show. How's your night? Uh, night going well, man. Appreciate you having me on. Of course, I enjoyed reading the book. I couldn't put it down as soon as I started. It was real in depth. And I know that you had a book previously that you wrote in the 90s and at the time in the land of giants, my life in basketball. And this was a new opportunity for you to be in a better space because at that time when you wrote your first one, your father passed and Reggie Lewis had passed at the time. So this was the time now to get everything out there in depth and a better state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. You just hit it on hit it on the nose. I mean, early on in my career, uh, when my pops and Reg passed away, they came to me and, and printed, presented that opportunity for me. And that was the early stage of my career. Um, I had a little time to kind of uh, live a little uh, throughout my journey, uh, the impact some players uh, along the way, as well as current players today. Um, and that's one mainly I wanted to put it out, uh, especially to today's uh, what we went through in, in, in society with the pandemic and so forth, we all need some sort of uplifting and positive vibes. And I felt this would be a, a positive, heartfelt more, uh, book uh, where it's kind of, you know, talk about relationships, uh, about my current, about the players that I kind of play with. I know I impacted along the way, the Alonzo Mornings, the Vince Carters, Dale Curry's along the way, and the current players as well. You know, Chris Paul, yeah. Stephen Curry. You know, Steph. so I'm fortunate enough to have Steph, Stephen Curry and Alonzo do the four with me. Yeah, it's amazing just to think about it and reading early on in your book how you were giving Steph airplane rides all in the locker room when you when you were in Charlotte when he was a kid. Yeah, that's amazing. Here it is. Uh, now he's known as the greatest shooter ever lace it up in the NBA. It's amazing, you know, his journey. Um, and, you know, Steph at the time, you know, he just wished he could get five foot three. He felt like if he get five three, he can make it to the NBA. So. You know, me changing the perceptions of a kid's mind, thinking that they only had to get to be six foot tall in order to make it that, that was pretty cool. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to read about and just your relationship with his father, Del Curry. Does Steph still call you to this day? Because I know he always acknowledges you for being an inspiration in his career. Does he still call you to this day for some tips and pointers? Well, no, Steph, he, he well beyond the tips and pointers. Uh, but you know, we have opportunity to... <laughs> up with one another and spend time with each other you know we relish that and I do because he's a busy man you know not only with his family his foundation and all the things that he's involved in you know we I, I kind of pride him on his time and because uh, I know what's that all about um, but it's grateful man to just to be witnessing what he's going through and what he's accomplishing him as well as Seth uh, uh, Carey um, and what Don with Dell and Sonya was able to, to create and, and maintain in terms of their development. So it's an honor to be witnessing it. My life of a kid in the projects to the Godfather small ball. Make sure you go check that out. And I want to dive right into this because it all began in your career once you did receive that ball from your godmother, that red and white ball. Yeah, that red and white blue ball, man, I tell you, that was such a precious gift to be receiving. You know, even though it was much bigger than myself, uh, I'm just so excited just to have an opportunity to go play with it, not even knowing what was waiting for me on that basketball court in terms, in terms of the cruelty with the kids, you know, was thrown at me by me being so small and the ball being in myself. But, you know, that's what I had to go through. And, and that was the adversity that I had to, to, to kind of endure and un overcome to understand how to be able to be strong-minded, to be able to stay on the path to where I can kind of fulfill my dreams. And the rec center was when everything started to come into fruition here especially with you playing basketball around the age of eight or nine and just hearing about all the training that you went through and especially with coach Howard too well that was a blessing you know that was a blessing that me and Reg you know was able to receive early on in our, our childhood uh being able to be tutored in school by Mr. Howard who had so much information so much knowledge floating around his head he was a former collegiate basketball player who happened to come to be the director of our recreation center. And he gave kids in that neighborhood vision, which we didn't think that existed. So for him to be able to take us under his wing, uh, to, 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 to not only mentor, but to drill us and train us, to get us and taught us the game of basketball. We were like two little sponges, just soaking up all that information. You know, whatever he said, we did. And we're so thankful for that because we turned out to be pretty good. And something I didn't know about you and reading about you in the book was when you got shot at the age of five, where it was just the buckshots that hit you. 
and it wasn't the complete bullet. And I learned about that. And that was just, that's insane to hear about, especially when you hear about the man whose window was broken into, he took the shotgun because the, you got blamed for it because it was someone else that threw the rock through the window. And then he came out with the shotgun and fired at you. Well, you know, it, it was uh, been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And for me, uh, knowing what type of environment that we was, in, you know, in uh, atmosphere that we, we was, you know, dealing with at the time, we knew that anything could possibly go off. Uh, but then that situation, you know, one of the guys' kid broke the old man Chester window. He came running out man, straight to his shed and grabbed that shotgun. And luckily, and fortunate enough, the bullet did miss my head, but the buckshots kind of hit me and went through me. But as a kid, five years old, you know, you're thinking that you was no longer be part of this world, you know, growing up in that type of environment, which we always just thought that, you know, life expectancy was only 20 years old. Um, so, you know, having just that short thought process and not even thinking anything beyond that until things started to change for me with the game of basketball to where, you know, a more brighter and bigger vision start to creep into my head and believe that anything is possible. And from that moment, you took it as a positive from that point, because as soon as you went onto the courts, because you were getting bullied based on your size, you didn't let that bother you anymore after that happened. Truly, absolutely. And that's, that will change any kid mindset. You know, yeah. even though you was a youngster uh, being picked on and, um, and words, we always say sticks and stones will hurt you, but it sticks and stones, words will never hurt you. That's not true because words couldn't affect you if you allow it to. But for me, and doing that type of drama and being able to overcome it. Uh, words was the least of my worries. You know, it was something more important that I was interested in and what the kids were saying, it just didn't have the same impact that it once did because again, I became more comfortable and more uh, less fearful about what they were saying and more important about what I wanted to do in life. What were some of the things when doing the research and going back to the 30 for 30 documentaries about your time in Dunbar that even shocked you that you forgot about? Oh, man, not much because I remember it all. I mean, <laughs> that journey was, so, it was so vivid. I mean, it was like, you know, when you accomplish something of and you make history, you know, every little detail become very important because that, that was our life that we was living. That was the neighborhood that we grew up in. It wasn't like we was being recruited um, and being able to accomplish all of those type of accolades individually as well as as a team. It was pretty special. Um, I, I remember all the trips, you know, starting from my 11th grade year, you know, going to Georgetown, Pennsylvania, the king of the bluegrass, up in New York, you know, playing those big tournaments in my senior year, been able to play against, they considered the number one team in the country. Uh, which was Camden, New Jersey, Billy Thompson and John Walls and those guys. Um, so it was special. Uh, it was special. So it wasn't much that I've forgotten that I once they go back into the archives. <laughs> and Dunbar is considered the greatest high school basketball team in history. And just you size Reggie Williams and Reggie Lewis. It was a special team. Yeah, we made history, you know, that year in 87 by all of us being drafted in the first round. Uh, and then already having a teammate in David Wingate already there. You know, That's right, so Wingate was there. Come, four, four of us coming out of the same high school, out of the same area and the same atmosphere, you know, being able to fulfill and keep that same dream going and motivate one another. And then that was special, you know, that was something that we all never forget. And we always cherish those type of moments. Yeah. You also played against the great Len Bias, rest in peace during your time in high school as well. And just hearing about that story, which was just so heartfelt because he didn't get to make it his dream of making it into the NBA. How did colleges change their approach with drug tests? And just if there were students and student athletes that got, that got addicted to drugs, did you notice any changes from that moment? Uh, when they decided, well, you weren't pretty much paying attention to all that. You were more or less staying within your own cocoon, um, knowing that the situation in terms of what the uh, NCAA was now requiring of athletes and uh, just to kind of keep them a, a, a test of what was going on and, and hopefully that, you know, they can kind of not put themselves in a difficult situation where it jeopardize their career. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the 86, what happened to Lenny, um, you know, wasn't to test it. You know, everybody didn't want to no one knew. Um, it's just something that he decided to do and unfortunately it cost him his life. Um, but he was a great guy, a great man, 
uh, an unbelievable player. I mean, playing against Lenny, I mean, you was looking at one of uh, another MJ, uh, just a little taller at six eight. Um, that's the type of skill set that he possessed. Um, and it was something, you know, just an honor to, to have the opportunity to play against a guy like that. And, and Reggie Lewis as well. He caused Jordan some problems when he was on the Celtics too. Yeah, Reg was, I mean, it was special, you know, having an opportunity to play the Boston Celtics in our first playoff, you know, serious opportunity for the franchise at Charlotte because it being an expansion team and being in this fifth year of existence, uh, having that opportunity to play your, not in not, not only just in a one of the established franchise, but one of your best friends along the side who was, was, was the star for that team at that particular time. You know, but when it all took place and him falling during our game and he just thinking he tripped. And, but once we found out the, the all the details that he would no longer be part of that series, you know, David and I really felt it's truly bad because, you know, we wanted to win what we wanted to win against, you know, our great friend that we grew up with because we wanted that type of competition and, and the chips fall where they may. And for him not to be part of that series, it felt... Uh, very tough, very difficult. But then afterwards, it was even more devastating. Yeah. And rest in peace to Reggie Lewis, one of the greatest to do it. And, you know, just learning about that story and you tending Wake Forest and the troubles that you had at that time, you were accused twice of cheating. One time yeah. actually was actually receiving more help on a term paper than you were supposed to get, apparently. Yeah, that is true. And, uh, and, and being able to overcome that first situation prepared me for that second situation. The first situation being able to, you know, being accused and when you didn't do anything and, you know, after you just coming off for a high, being able to divine to make it all the way to the lead eight uh, as a freshman um, and, you know, losing to the five slime pajamas and then coming home and have to take an exam, but you wasn't prepared and you let your professor know that you wasn't and he just told you, come on in and they would get your makeup test. But then actually when you just go and just sign your name and, you know, but, they accuse you anyway and find you guilty for no reason because of the color of my skin. You know, that really was, uh, you know, a slap in the face. And I felt like, you know, I wanted to leave and, and not even be part of that organization anymore. But, you know, my, my, my competitive, you know, my, where I came from all came into fruition. And I let myself know that I can't leave this. I can't let these people you know, run me away from something that I want uh, deeply. And, and it wasn't nothing in my, on my side that I did wrong. So being able to overcome that, and then again, what you mentioned too, alluded to about the cheating and on the paper where I had a tutor kind of proofread my paper and um, that professor at that particular time wanted to try to make a, a statement, but I think I had a little more uh, knowledge about the situation and, and had a little more on my side as well, the same situation in terms of what I was able to do uh, personally with myself in terms of the work that I put in as opposed to just having someone proofread it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I overcame it. You know, that was, those are the adversity things that you had to, you know, deal with in life and, and not, you know, shy away from it, but tackle it head on. Has the university changed since then? Is there, has the, those incidents ceased from what you were? Because you've been back there. Yeah, well, you know, I don't hold everybody in regards to that. What my situation was about, I don't look at everybody in that way. Um, I treat people as they treat me, and I look at them and, and, and find the faults the way they conduct themselves on a, on a day to day basis. Um, my daughter even went back to Wake, went to Wake Forest, and graduated from Wake Forest. So that's how much I still believe in Wake Forest. Um, so I had no hard feelings about Wake, um, about the people that there. You know, there was just an incident that an isolated incident that I had to. Uh, overcome and, and go through in order to be the man that I am today. Uh, so again, I will always keep Wake Forest at a high regard. And just learning about your freshman year because you saw Hakeem Olajuwon and Michael Jordan play your freshman year. Yeah, playing against MJ and Olajuwon my freshman year, I mean, that was, again, you didn't know much about them at the time. They were just basketball players that we was playing against. And Michael became who he was after he left you know, the ACC, but at that particular time, you know, we was, uh, it was Michael Jordan, Kenny Smith, but, you know, in the backcourt that we wanted to, you know, beat at Wake Forest. But again, you know, MJ and, and, and that whole Carolina uh, organization was tough to beat.
Kenny Smith was your roommate when you played overseas. Yeah, during the USA uh, Olympics uh, trials that he and I was fortunate enough to make to represent uh, in 86, the USA team in the Goodwill Games, uh, the last collegiate team that won the gold medal. Um, we just fortunate enough to roommate with one another. And Kenny got a lot of stories to tell on behalf of our roommating with each other. And he felt that one of his stories he liked to tell that he thought that he was, he had a big guy to roommate because when he walked in and he opened the closet, he saw some pants hanging and he thought that, okay, there's some big shorts. And, and realized that those were my pants hanging up. And, and then he, uh, so he always kid me about that. Said, Man, I thought I had a big, the tall guy's remember, I just thought he had some big shorts and there it is, those were your long pants. So, yeah, he allowed his kid about those things. But we had a great opportunity again to represent the United States and you know wear that across your, your chest and, and being able to be successful and bring home that gold medal. You know, First one in 30 years. Yeah, and then that was and that and that was the last collegiate team, as I say, that won that on won that gold medal and, and accomplished that type of goal. So you know the likes of myself, Kenny Smith, as I mentioned, David Robson, as well as the late Armin Gilliam and Steve Kerr, uh, great guys that were on that team. Yeah, and and around then, just reading the book, that was when Steve Kerr's father was assassinated, and you had the whole war going on over there with terrorism, and, and there were actually choppers flying across your hotel room, and you had to have armed guards outside the doors. That is correct, and and we felt really bad for Steve at the time because we really wasn't uh, any type of had any type of uh, engagement in politics uh, and, and that sort of stuff, but. When we heard about the assassination of him, we just, you know, we, we, we gathered and, you know, we could send out condolences and we try to you know, console him. But he wanted to just think about winning a gold medal. You know, Steve was all about appreciate, you know, our concerns, but, you know, he was focused. You know, he was focused and he understood what the situation was. And that's one of the reasons why he speaks how, so highly about the government, about gun violations and all that sort of stuff. And I'm so proud to be, you know, to call him a, a, a friend. You also played against Petrovic, and when I did my reading up about it, you held him to 12 to 15 points under what he would normally score. Yeah, Drazen Petrovic was a beast, man. He was like the Michael Jordan over Yugoslavia. Um, but once I studied his game and looked at what his strength was, um, I told Coach and that, you know, I think that I should guard him as opposed to Kenny because uh, that was Kenny, man, on the two position, and I felt like Kenny should be guarding uh, the point guard, I think I can kind of disrupt Patrick, slow him down. And Kenny said, well, go ahead. And, you know, if you start to have your way, then I'll come over and get on him. You know, Kenny never got an opportunity to get on him because, you know, I was all in Patrick, the late Patrick, I should say, and made it very difficult for him to score. Just a memorable series right there and winning that gold medal. Congratulations to you and everything that you did, especially representing the country out there. And, you know, just learning about your whole career, going into the NBA, going to the Washington Bulletin, it all comes full circle and just reading about it in the book. You were shot at the age of five and you're getting drafted to an eight, the team named Washington Bullets. <laughs> and that's crazy. That's it is. Man. You just can't make none of that up, man. And it's, uh, but I'm thankful, you know, and if we put that on because it made me, you know, make history and go back and play in a, a town that's pretty much like your backyard. Uh, growing up in Baltimore. So I am grateful and always hold the bullets now as the Wizards in high regards. Yeah. And Wes Unsell, the, your first coach, now I was surprised about how he treated you that year. And, and it, it was great for you to get out of that situation. And that's why you chose number one once you were drafted to the Hornets, once the expansion teams came along, because you felt as though going to the Hornets, that was really your first year in the league. Well, one was always going to be my number. I was one at the Bullets. Um, that, and I chose that number mainly because I was 14 my entire career, and here it is, being drafted in the first round at 12 selection. I figured I needed to drop the four and pick the one. Um, but my very first coach at the NBA uh, player was Kevin Lockery. Uh, Kevin Lockery coached us for the first 14 games, and then Wes Sunsell took over. And Wes, you know, I guess he was the old school type of coach, um, and he wanted those type of players that he was accustomed with the Moses and the Bernard King, who was on the tail end of that career. Um, and I thought we was going to be suited to start being more of an up-tempo style because that's what, that's why the reason they drafted me. But, you know, after the exit meeting, getting told that they were going to go in that direction, they was going to 
bring some players in the kind of super style of play that I like to play. Uh, but once I got back to my apartment, I got a phone call to let me and realize that the ugly heads of the NBA just presented this up saying that, you know, my agent told me that I was just being non-protected from the expansion, from the bullets to where the Charlotte Hornets the expansion team will have an opportunity to select me. And I, I was very pissed at the moment, you know, but as it sunk in, and as I realized going back to North Carolina, where I just come from, uh, playing for collegiate basketball there, it kind of, you know, gave a more and more feeling. And then I was looking forward to going back, you know, presenting it my did. opportunity. It, it just thinking about it with the New York Knicks, <laughs> thinking about it, the New York Knicks, they were always a thorn in your side, but you could have potentially been drafted with them on draft night because you were talking to Mark Jackson. You're like, I hear the Knicks need a point guard. And you're like, I hear the Bullets need a point guard. Yeah, Mark and I, we knew that both teams need a point guard and the Knicks were more or less interested in me at the time because I visited them and they talked to him about it. And the Bullets was more interested in Mark. And they talked to Mark, and he thought that he was going to go. But while we were sitting next to one another, we just had that feeling that we were both going home. You know, that we we both was going back to our, you know, our rightfully place. And then when once they called my name, 12, and he knew he was going 18 to New York. And, uh, and we both got our, our wishes and for him. You know, he had a great year that year, winning the rookie of the year. He did, especially then he was traded away, unfortunately. And just thinking about it, when your your time with Manu Bowl uh, on the Bullets, you had a great friendship with him. One of the funniest guys you ever met. <laughs> him killing lions with spears when you had that conversation on the plane. Yeah, Nudie was something special, man. I truly, truly miss him. He and I was getting to know one another really well. Uh, but that first year, we just kind of connected. And even though the short and tall of it, uh, we just connected and. Uh, people didn't realize we didn't have private planes at the time. We had to fly commercial. And they only had eight first-class seats. And we were the youngest, so we always got bumped. So Manute, as being seven, six foot tall, had to fly in the back with his knees all the way up to his chest because the seats was kind of brutal. Sometimes he was able to get, we get exit road, um, give him a little more room. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we, he, we weren't able to get exit road because of uh, the uh, first come first serve situation, and he was always, you know, have something to say, you know, during our trips. And one of those sayings where I would monkey, I used to kill lions with spears. Uh, like, come on, dude, what kind of lions are those? Why they lions with no teeth in their mouth? Yeah, he used to always to have fun with that, but I miss him dearly. Yeah. Rest in peace to him, and even blocking his shot in practice, and he was chasing you around for like 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, he he didn't like that. He didn't no. like me blocking his shot. And, uh, you know, he always would cry to himself and want to shoot the ball. And then with that one-on-one -on -one Moses, I mean, I think that made Moses' day uh, probably one of his best days of his life because he laughed so hard watching Manute trying to catch me. I was just playing with him, dunking him, because I know he couldn't catch me. And uh, But I was just making him run. And yeah. him looking like a big old giraffe just going around that gym trying to catch me. It was funny. Charlotte Hornets, you're, you're drafted there. You... Team up with your buddy, Del Curry, who's always been supportive of you throughout your career and meeting with him at the camps. And, and you've spoken about that in the book, and I think it, it's important that I mention that so that if there's potential players listening here if they're, or they have aspirations of going pro one day is to join the NBA camps to get your name known. Because you've spoken about it before, if there's top picks out there that skip these camps out and any opportunities, that's when they'll fall in the draft. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Different times, I think different eras kind of um, dictate who and how players look at themselves. Um, but it still comes down to being able to present yourself in the best light. Yeah. And no matter what your stock may be, and normally the first five guys, you know, top five guys, they know where they're going. They know where they are. And they kind of more or less, you know, don't have to show up to those types of camps because their stocks is already at a certain point. But you know, you uh, you there. There we go. Now we're good. <laughs> the Zoom. The Zoom oh. yeah. But yeah, as I was saying, is that, um, and what was I saying? Oh, uh, we, we were talking about the players. It's a different time now and so, being able right. to present yourself in the best light. Absolutely. And, and, and I was mentioning about that, about how Scotty Pippen and myself was able to do just that. And, you know, I think a player that it really stands out for me. I think who didn't take advantage of it in my era was a guy like Steve Alford. 
you know, Steve Alford had won the championship and um, they was kind of, you know, promoting him really highly. And I think his stock was kind of in the middle and I guess he felt like he didn't need to go. And I think that hurt him, you know, because of his situation uh, coming off of the NCAA championship, he felt he rolled that out. And I think his stock hurt him and, and my, by me going, it helped me and put me in a position to become the 12th player overall. Yeah, and just an amazing career from there and going to the Hornets and developing a relationship with Rex Chapman because he's a great friend of yours and he always advocates for you that you need to be in the Hall of Fame. And I think one day it's going to happen and just learning about it in 2016, you were voted to be put up there and potential to get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I was a nominee. I was grateful, you know, hey, that's for others to decide whether or not I'm on it for that cause. I'm just grateful that the career that I was able to have I'm grateful for, you know, all the opportunities. I know they go about the numbers and all that, um, but, you know, it's the things that impact the game and, and what you mean to the game also should be part of it as well, uh, from the high school to college as well as the NBA should be taken into consideration. But, you know, again, that ain't for me the, the decision to make. You know, again, if I do get the call, I'll be thankful. If I don't, then I'm still grateful for, you know, the, the, my career that I was able to have. Um, and throughout my journey. Yeah, it's just one of the all-time greats. And just thinking about it, because your first pair of sneakers that you got were all white Chuck Taylors. Were you ever approached throughout your career for your own line of Muggsy Bogue sneakers? Well, you know, I signed with Converse my very first year. You know, wow. So I was with Converse, and I had uh, shoes, and I signed with Reebok. I also had shoes with Reebok. Um, so, you know, back then, they was putting in this shoe. We wasn't that. I, only true guys had their own name shoe which was Michael and then Shaq. And then they had us in uh, the, the 88s and, and then Reebok. Um, but, and I almost signed a deal with Michael Rubin uh, called, you know, called the Mucksters. Um, but that never materialized uh, with the company. Uh, but, you know, I just had fun with it. You know, people, you know, played around with some of the endorsements and all that, but I enjoyed it all the time. It was an opportunity that I had to, to, to be part of. Yeah. What was your approach? Because there's plenty of pictures, and I love the pictures that you put at the end of your book, especially one of you guarding Mike, Michael Jordan, and I've seen plenty of highlights of you stealing the ball from him, give him a tough time. What was your approach and technique? Because you, you weren't afraid of anyone, especially defending in the NBA. You would go right out there. You were Muggsy, so you just go out there and defend whoever it was. It was you, Even hearing in the book about when other players tried to help you to guard them, you're like, get the F away from me. <laughs> it, well, what was your yeah. approach to, to guard and Michael Jordan? What was your technique of guarding? Could people consider the greatest of all time? Yeah, it, it was no technique. It was pretty much the type of aggressive vice grip defense that I always put on my player, you know, in terms of making them channels to get the ball across that court for one, because as a point guard, that's where it all starts. And then once we cross that court, you know, if you get switched up on a guy like a Michael Jordan, knowing the type of skill set he possessed, uh, but again, the respect that I was able to get, you know, of course, you saw him turn his back as opposed to just trying to face me and coming right at me. You know, he turned his back to use the size factor and, and try to back me down. But I was fortunate enough to smack the ball down uh, as he going up. Uh, but understanding the game, knowing how to play the game, allowed me to play it as long as I was able to play it as opposed to just sitting on the bench and watching it and being just a guy that came off and gave a few minutes here and there. Um, the IQ level and understand how to make guys run you better and running your team was always at the forefront. Something that stands out about you when just learned about your story is how you embraced Larry Johnson right away, calling him on draft night and telling him that if you want to win rookie of the year, you're going to work hard and I'm going to help you win it. Well, yeah, that was just the relationship that I've, we had with all our players, but yeah. as LJ as a rookie, when Lonzo was as a rookie, you know, him and Shaq was battling. Um, and then we knew that Shaq was going to get it, but Lowe was, was always right there in it. Um, and then it was LJ, when his opportunity came, um, I felt like him and Dikembe was right neck and neck. And I felt like he had the opportunity to really separate himself. And then I just, when I told him, I asked him, did he want to win it? And he was like, oh, come on, little guy, you know I want to win it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But then he felt like, you know, the next thousand or 1500 passes start coming his way. And uh, he was really special, highlighting and putting on some unbelievable performance during those during those times. 
Yeah. It's a shame just how the team broke up and just what could have been, especially if you drafted Kobe Bryant. Imagine if you kept everyone together with Lonzo and LJ and you. That would have been an all-time team right there of what could have been. What was your approach in keeping the guys together? Because in learning about it, that LJ and Alonzo Morton just not getting along at times and keeping them together at practice. Well, I mean, that was more than me. That when they was teammates with the Hornets, they we all got along with one another. I mean, we played cards and everything. We went out. That was one of the tight neck groups that I've ever been associated with. And it's kind of unusual to hear that about the NBA. But we was really strong. Everybody supported each other just to come over at our house and visit each other. Um, but I think when Larry and Lonzo left the Hornets, that's when the tension started. That's when everything kind of went to a different, you know, they developed the identities of their teams. He was one was with the Knicks, one with the Heat. So, you know, all that kind of came out and, and that played off one another. But while they was with the Hornets, I mean, we was in the battles uh, with one another. And it was just unfortunately for Zoe during that time, it was contract. And when the Hornets then matched his contract and, you know, Miami came up with the number that it did, then, you know, he took his, his talent to South Beach. And then that was the beginning of the end because right after that, LJ had got hurt because he had just signed this 12-year deal with $84 million. And, you know, by getting hurt and not being able to be his old self again and um, things kind of were in the media and they kind of ran with it and they traded him for Mason. You know, and then that, and then from that moment on, I knew Dal and I were just, were just a matter of time, even though we was told otherwise. But uh, we all know what that NBA is about and how it operates. Yeah, and, and just hearing about when you were traded because you 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 thought that you were going to retire a Hornet, and then the coach at the time in, in your last year with the Hornets said that you should retire, and that was just blasphemous in my opinion. And then you had to go to the Warriors and prove yourself. Well, I, I proved myself even for him before I even re went to the Warriors. You know, yeah. they, I was on one leg when they bagged me to play. Uh, and that's when I discovered acupuncture. And here it is. We won more games in the entire franchise history that year by winning 56 games and, um, and losing to New York in the playoff that year. Uh, but after I decided, after they decided and, you know, that he came out and told me that I needed to retire, <laughs> you know, in the paper, which was kind of blasphemous. I mean, it just kind of proved the point that, you know, anything could be said and anything could be written. Um, but I just felt like it was time to move on from that situation and go ahead and, and recreate some other memories. Yeah, so, and you did. And then the Knicks were always a thorn in, my, in your side. And, you know, I have a picture here that I want to show you because it's you with LJ. And if you could tell me what you guys were saying to each other in this picture, if you can remember. <laughs> Oh yeah, hell. That, we actually he was just trying to guard me one on one. That was just one on one. Yeah, yeah, he was trying to guard me, and, I, and he fell, and he got fouled. And that's when I was, and we was kind of jocking at each other, and that's when he grabbed me and told me, "Boy, I love you." He put his grab my head, and I, yeah, that's my guy. I mean, those were the special moments. You know, we had to go with one another as well as play against each other. Yeah, and you played with, with a ton of Nick legends as well, especially with Latrell Sprewell once you got to Golden State. And I didn't even realize that when you were with the team, that was when the choking incident happened. You were right there in practice. Yeah, I just got traded there a week um, after the incident happened. Um, I was only there for a week. Um, we just got finished losing to the Lakers, and we had practice the next day. And, and during that game with the Lakers, you know, Shaq was having his way. He was, you know, this, they was beating us pretty soundly. And Shaq would start coming down and making, doing all kinds of stuff with the ball. And, and, and Spree was pissed. You know, PJ called timeout. And Spree was, you know, it's a fucking joke. This is a joke. And we doing this and that. So we get to practice the next day. Obviously, we, you know, let the we kind of break up and do our little rap and fire drills. Uh, Spree, while I'm not down there shooting, uh, doing our rap and fire drills, then that's when Coach PJ came down and, and told Pete, I mean, he told Spree to put something on the pass to Muncy. We both looked at each other like, what, what are you talking about? I said, put, and then he came back and said, yeah, I said, put something on, put something on, F the pass on the Muncy. And that's when Spree just looked and kind of turned around and, and just threw the ball down and like said, what the fuck? Muncy ain't saying about nothing. And that's when he said, well, get the F out of practice. And that's when everything took place. 
Oh man, it, you really are because you described it in the book as being the Forrest Gump of the NBA. You really are, and especially just learning about your wife because just the relationship that you went through of getting remarried after being divorced, and she she worked on one of the most probably the big, one of the biggest shows of all time in The Wire on HBO. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and being from Baltimore, yeah, you know, she from Baltimore, so that was a special moment. And here it is again. That's why this thing, this is about relationships. All sorts of relationships, you know, the relationships we talked about with the players, but then the relationships I've also I talked about with my wife, you know, losing uh, a friend and then being able to rekindle our relationship all over again after being divorced for 10 years, uh, you know, something that's kind of unheard of. But again, that, that, that's for, for couples who go through things, who, you know, see things at a different time in, in life where possibly they can kind of look at this and maybe take a step back and kind of say, hey, no, hold on, I need to hold off for a second and rethink some things uh, because that's what relationships is all about. So I'm thankful that we was able to, that God brought us back together because, you know, we're all about family and, you know, and having kids together is always makes it that much special. Yeah. And you've always been rooted in family, especially with your mother and then learning about your father and your sister and your brother. And when you got that million dollar contract in your rookie year, you, bought yourself a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> you, you bought your mother a house and then you helped hire an attorney to get your father out of jail. Absolutely. I used it very wisely, yeah. you know, and I kind of uh, made sure that mom's had her dream home and uh, being able to just sit back and relax and not have to worry about going to work or doing anything. Uh, that was a special moment for me. Um, uh, being able to do that and award her that and then able to you know, later on and be able to help my dad, you know, get out of prison and start to live a better life. Uh, but, you know, the streets got the best of them. And, uh, but that's understanding how Baltimore operates. Yeah. And, and rest in peace to your father and just learn about it. And then from all the way going from the Warriors to the Raptors. And before we get to the Raptors, I got to bring up this because this is a hip hop show. You being mentioned in Tribe Called Quest, Steve Biko. Oh, yeah, yeah, Tribe. The height of Muggsy, complexion of a hockey puck. Uh, by the hockey puck, that's exactly right. You know, and I always kind of, when I ran to him, I appreciate that, that shout out. Uh, because back then, you know, hip hop was just becoming so popular and we always, you know, had our headsets on and we couldn't wait to, you know, hear what that guy had to say and what they were talking about. And then let alone hear your name being part of one of the, the songs. The tribe had always been one of our favorite, my favorite artists. Q-Tip, Fife Dog, mm -hmm. some of the greatest they artists. Are. They are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about it, years later, you would be in the Celebrity All-Star Game it being coached under Kevin Hart, and then the opposite coach was Drake. Yeah, yeah, Kev, I let him go ahead and wear my number two. Yeah. Uh, I, let, I let him wear number one, so I took, I, I got a little crib, and I wore 5'3". Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't 53, it was 5'3", the height. So we kind of uh, make that all stand out. But we had a good time. We had T-Mac uh, on our squad and uh, uh, making sure that, you know, Kevin uh, shined the way he needed to shine and get the, the MVP of that game. But we had some fun out there. I always have fun with you in those type of settings. Yeah. Did, did Drake come up to you and pay homage? Because he's a huge Raptor fan. He's like their ambassador now. Did he come up and pay homage for your time with the Raptors? Oh. Oh yeah, Drake and I see each other a lot, you know, especially when I go back to Toronto. Um, you know, they honored us uh, several times and he's all, he was at the game. Of course we, you know, we, we, give, we give our respect to one another when we see each other, when each other's present. And I always appreciate Drake. Yeah. And just getting to the Toronto Raptors, Vince Carter and T-Mac, they embraced you for your leadership. And why is it so important, especially when players get later in their career to accept that leader role and that they're a veteran now and it's about passing the baton and helping out the youth? Because when I look at certain players, I'm not going to mention names, but sometimes they don't want to be that player that comes off the bench. They're so used to being the star. It's a difficult transition for them. Well, because they understand, they keep it real and they understand yeah. their, their journey. And knowing that it can't last forever yeah. and knowing that your body go through difficult times. And when you have young talent and you see that they are now the future of the franchise and you're still part of it, you want to make sure that you give them all the tools that they possibly can to be the best version that they can be. And at the time, Vince and T-Mac were so young, they were so talented and they just needed direction. They just need the right information 
how they continue to prolong their journey uh, on their careers. And we was able to give them great leadership, mentorship, understanding what this game and how to approach it each and every night. And by them witnessing it and by them asking questions and being around it, you know, they took it and, and, and embraced it and used it part of their journey. And they went on and did the same for, you know, their youngers once they became uh, the veterans of the team. And the Vince played 22 seasons. I mean, that's unheard of. You know, T Mac, you know, playing as long as he did. I mean, in the career and the type of accolades they was able to accomplish throughout their career is an amazing. Two Hall of Famers. Oh, absolutely. And, and you helping them go to the playoffs. And you, you actually were a part of the, the time when Vince did win the dunk contest, in which we saw those four famous dunks. Yeah, yeah. He never told us what he was going to do. Uh, but we always just told him, listen, boy, you better not embarrass us. You better go out there and do something special. And he said, you know, we're going to do our thing. You know, never just him. We're going to do our thing. And he sure enough went and did his thing. <laughs> and I'm so proud of Vince. Vince is such a great individual, not only just a basketball player, just a great human being and a great teammate. And uh, him and his mom, I mean, they really embraced me once I was there. When I was going through my contract situation, you know, he stepped in. And he stepped in and said, hey, this is what it needs to be for Muggsy. Um, if not, then, hey, we got problems. And, of course, they listened to Vince, the star of the franchise. And I was I was able to sign a four-year deal, at which was promised to me anyway. And they realized that they had to obligate it and honor that obligation. And I'm thankful for Vince for making that happen. And just hearing about your last year in the NBA in which your mom passed away and just how much of a rough point that was in your life and rest in peace to her and everything that she taught you. Because from there, you, you started the foundation that you have right now, the Muggsy Bogues Family Foundation because of your mom. Absolutely. My mom meant everything to me. She was the world. I mean, when she lost her life, I mean, I just had no more energy to go out there and play the game. I had three yeah. years left on my contract. Uh, I was thankful for Mark Cuban, who took over the organization at the time, to honor the contract, but just took me off the books. Um, my mom, I mean, she's she again. I mean, by her uh, instilling those type of principles in me, you know, I wanted to make sure that I did the right thing when I had it, when I, by putting in the situation to help those less fortunate. And that's one of the reasons why we created the Always Believe Foundation. Now we, we translate into the Muggsy Bogues Family Foundation to where we now awarding scholarships to trade down students as well as feeding the community and trying to give them a better opportunity. So, you know, feeding the with these families and to give them opportunity to, to kind of live a better quality of life. That's what we're all about. And thank you for doing that. That's that's a big thing right there that you're doing to help out the youth and the communities. And you're great friends with Oakley because he came to the Raptors, another Knicks legend right there, an enforcer on the court. How was it just playing alongside him because he's been known to be an enforcer and just you look back at all the fights that you used to get into and you look at the league today of how we don't condone violence. I know you don't, especially when you said it in the book, but just seeing how soft that the league has gotten over the years, it was like Oakley was a gem. Yeah, yeah. Oakley definitely was an enforcer. I mean, yeah. he, everywhere he went, he more or less uh, laid it on the line for his standard for himself, for his teammates. And everybody knew that about Oakley. And uh, you love having him as a teammate. Uh, he's a realist. I mean, he's a brother. I mean, he's my brother on and off the court. I mean, I love him dearly uh, because of what he stands for and what he means. And, and he never should cope anything in terms of trying to uh, please uh, please someone, knowing that if it's wrong, uh, he's going to say it like it is. I and mean, when you real like that and you understand how people like that operate, I mean, those are people that you want to be associated with and want to be part of. Yeah, and you're a part of a lot of history, especially in the NBA, but outside of it, in, in entertainment as well, because you got Space Jam, Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David, and even Anthony Anderson. Yeah, yeah, hang time. We did hang time together. That was Anthony when he was first starting out, uh, getting into his TV uh, uh, world, um, and just being able to go from there and be part of some of these you know, legendary uh, actors, man, it's, it's amazing. You know, I never set out to be part, you know, being able to do some of these cameos and be part of the, the SNLs. And, and Eddie uh, with Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg, Joanna Man. Joanna Man, yeah. <laughs> Miguel funny. Nunez. Yes, yes. And Miguel, he still owed me some money for a horse game, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but after your NBA career, you went right into coaching with the WNBA and the Sting. 
Yeah, I really enjoyed working with the ladies. They was true professionals. We took over um, the end of 2006, where they only had 10 games remaining. Then we was fortunate enough to coach the whole entire season in 2007 before uh, Mr. Bob Johnson got rid of the, the franchise, dispersed the franchise. But I really enjoyed working with the ladies. I mean, again, like I said, they were true professionals. They, they really uh, focused a lot on the fundamentals of the game, even though we had athletes involved. Um, and, and capable of dunking and all that, but the fundamental was at the forefront, and they really relished and and played it at the best. And I, I think a lot of men need to look at some of that skill set that they have in terms of the fundamental aspect of it and apply that to their game, along with their athleticism. <laughs> if the opportunity arose for a coaching job in the NBA, would you take it? In the NBA, uh, you know, I had opportunities to coach in the NBA. Um, now at this stage of my career, maybe, I don't know. I mean, the Hornets will be the only situation, you know, by being here. Uh, and again, you know, it's a process. I mean, right now they, they trying to find a coach, uh, and, and, and the candidate right now with, with two at the prime, uh, at the top of the list right now, two candidates. But I, I mean, if opportunity, if someone asks me, I would have to think about it today anyway, um, but it, it only have to be, it is only going to happen if it's in Charlotte. Yeah, it, that, that's where your heart is. And, and it was a difficult breakup for you guys in which you were traded out because you thought you were going to be retired a Hornet. But something that you were really mad about was when the team moved to New Orleans. Yeah, and I felt the franchise always should have remained in Charlotte. This is the system. This is where it began. But things happened. I guess Mr. Shen felt like because of the city uh, declined the referendum and um, he felt his, you know, back was against the wall that he decided to take the team to, to South Beach. I mean, South Beach to New Orleans, um, down at, at the Mardi Gras situation. Um, and, you know, they went down there, they had some success. Uh, Chris Paul was fortunate enough to play as a New Orleans Hornet. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't the same. His, no, it found his way back to his original city. I mean, Charlotte is where it should be. You know, this is where it was born. This is where it was the birth of it. And, you know, it just didn't sound right, New Orleans Hornets. So, yeah. and the Bobcats in Charlotte sound like being in Charlotte. So, once we got the Hornets back, everybody in the state and the surrounding region was proud and happy because we got the teal and purple back. Michael Jordan became the owner. And, and what's funny and just learning about more of the Michael Jordan story, his parents used to go to a lot of Hornets games. They supported you guys. Absolutely. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan, they was season ticket holders. Yeah. And uh, they, they was just sitting there at the game the very first time we beat Michael in 88 on doing just before uh, Christmas uh, when Kirk tipped it in. Uh, they were sitting right there. Uh, <laughs> and, and they came to pretty much a lot of our games. And uh, they was really Hornet fans. And I appreciate Mr. Jordan for that, him and Mr. Jordan. Yeah. Was it difficult for you to accept the Hornets back once they wanted you to be an ambassador at all because of the heartbreak in which you thought you were going to be there forever, uh, retire Hornet? Absolutely not, because I was part of the campaign to award the Hornets back here. Actually, it was the Bobcats just getting the franchise. But once we was given the name back and the rights, I mean, it was just – a thrill and excitement moment for everybody. And I believe that they sold within a month Hornets merchandise more than they did in the six or seven years entire history of the Bobcats. They probably outsold them in one month for merchandise. And that's how crazy the people were about that tail of purple. Yeah. I, I can't wait for you guys to get the old school logo back. I wish that would come back. Yeah, that would be sweet to see that that little bubble beast floating around, stinging around, but you know, they got the little swarm right now that be the swarming around this, the arena. Yeah. <laughs> and now you got LaMelo Ball on the team. You spoke about him in the book and you just said that he understands the game and he's got it. He definitely has it. I mean, at a young age, he, he, he got the instincts, he got the, the, the skill set, um, and also he got the willingness because he's so hungry to be that type of stardom player that he desperately could be. And I'm loving and witnessing it in first hand and being able to be here up close and watching the development and, and seeing him to progress. I mean, it's overwhelming. So he keeps the building electrified and I think they're gonna surround him with the correct players and hopefully we can lead that to a championship here.
That would be that would be amazing for you guys, especially just honoring your legacy. And, and Charlotte deserves a ring, 100%. Just the working, when you learn about the history, and just all about what could have been, and if you kept Kobe. Have you had conversations with LaMelo Ball? Has he reached out to you for any advice? No, the COVID situation kind of screwed a lot of things up, and I know a lot of teams don't want the players around. I want the players around a lot of folks and, and, and people in that regard, but I try to stay out of everybody's way. Um, and um, I, we had a couple of events together uh, where we had to serve the community. Uh, we spoke, hey, Melo, you know, we, we kept it moving, though, because it, was, it wasn't the time to kind of chit-chat, but we'll find the opportunity. I know we, it, it, that moment will happen. I enjoyed reading all the forewords in your book. Which one were you surprised most about reading? I love reading the one from your daughter about Steph Curry and her being the first crutch. Crutch, yeah, Brittany and Steph. Yeah, they, I mean, my old kids grew up with one another. And, uh, and at the time, Steph and Steph, um, I mean, uh, Brittany and Steph and, you know, always, you know, that hung around each other. And, you know, as kids, you know how little boys are. And they think they're, and girls, they have that little boyfriend, I'm my boyfriend, girlfriend crush, passing notes and that sort of stuff. Uh, but it was fun to hear them uh, mention that type of, you know, uh, the relationship they have with each other as they was kids. It's, it's, it's fun to, to read about. But I enjoyed all the forwards. I appreciate them all because, you know, it was heartfelt and knowing that how you impacted them and, and how, you know, you became part of their lives and in, 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 in a way that they see it, you know, that was very, you know, warming. You did. It, I have a question. Is your rec center still down there in Baltimore? Is that still open? No, they revitalized it. They unploaded the entire community and they revitalized the area. So we no longer have high rise buildings, it's all apartment, low rise oh. apartment. And we got a new rec center called the Pleasant Garden. Gentrification, because where I grew up, I used to play in the YMCA all the time, and that closed down too. And it just sees that you just see the emergence of gentrification everywhere, and it's just unbelievable. You can't go back to your roots. No, no. I mean, never realized how much that was a safe haven for so many kids growing up and having those type of facilities. You know, recreation was, you know, the means where you can go and do, you know, escape and become, you know, a kid that you always wanted to be, regardless of what it was, arts and crafts, um, sports, or whatever that case may be. Yeah. Today you're enjoying yourself, though. You're relaxing, you're playing chess, watching a lot of Netflix, hanging out with your dog, playing Wii Boxing, <laughs> a lot of yeah. golf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm starting to find, you know, how with the older guys, how they spend their time. Uh, but I still feel, you know, energetic. Yeah, I still feel... Uh, Bible enough to to be able to do anything I choose to do. You know, I'm in good health. I'm just trying to, you know, enjoy as much as I can while I can. Yeah. You got your own podcast with Charles Oakley, too. Yeah, we had the three OGs. We on hiatus right now. And I meet him and Earl Curtin. And we had some amazing guests on. I mean, T Mac. Vince Carter. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. J. I mean, Candace Parker. I mean, Rex, we had, I mean, just goes on Lonzo morning. We had a whole slew of guys that came on. Larry from the, uh, from the wire, but also played in uh, Walking Dead. Yeah. That's what Chad Coleman. Chad, yeah. 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 No, but Muggsy, one hell of a career that you have here. I can't wait to hear your name called in the Hall of Fame. I'm looking forward to everything that you have in the near future. Is there anything else that you want to speak about that we didn't cover in this interview? No, we, we covered it all, boss. I appreciate you, man. I really appreciate this opportunity to, to share, you know, my journey with you. And then I really, you know, thank you for this, this time that you, you know, you gave me. Of course. Thank you for everything that you've done for the NBA, especially for people who may be 5'3 and are on the short side because reading this book. Because when I was younger, I went through my own scarcity of being short and just that getting into me and just seeing how much of an inspiration you were to people growing up either in, in your time and in the people growing up right now and just seeing if they want to pursue basketball. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It's all about the heart. Heart over height. Heart over height, but confidence is the key. You know, regardless of what industry you're in, what you're trying to pursue, if you don't have the confidence within yourself, how are you going to screw that off to others? So I always tell people, man, you know, people always try to tell you who you want to be, who you should be, but confidence will always dictate who you're going to be.
Absolutely right and well said. Muggsy Bogues, thank you again for coming on the show. Anytime that you want to come on here, that you have anything else to promote, you're always welcome on the show. Make sure you go check out Muggsy, My Life from a Kid in the Projects, to The Godfather of Small Ball. You can get it at every store that they sell any books or any digital download and reading platforms. Make sure you go download it. It's a great read for basketball fans and even basketball players out there. You want a great read, go check this out. I highly recommend it. Appreciate you, boss. Thanks for having me again, man. Enjoy the rest of the evening. You too. Thank you, Muggsy. Okay, fine. Yeah, bye-bye.